Cup of Club today. Hopefully you've got your cup of tea or coffee at the ready. Um, and we're going to be talking to um, two community energy pioneers today. And so I'd like to introduce to you Kate Royston uh, from Tamar Community Energy and Andy O'Brien from Bristol Energy. So welcome both. Um, thanks for joining today. Uh, we are going to be having a chat about all things community energy. Uh, let me just run through the format of the session before we get going. So um, everybody who is participating can listen in and submit any questions that they would like through the chat function. Um, and I will try and feed in those questions in our discussion, or we can do a quick fire Q&A at the end if there's any specific ones that we haven't got to yet. Um, we've got 45 minutes scheduled. We can run to an hour if we need to. Um, and just to say, uh, we are not promoting the um, businesses specifically in terms of financial promotions. This is just showcasing two good organizations who FX has been working with recently. Um, and none of the discussions today should be treated as financial advice. Um, and we can't answer any specific questions relating to your own personal financial circumstances. Um, there's lots of information on the FX website, uh, which you can go to uh, to find out more information. And we will send out a um, we will also send out a um, email after the event as well, and that will follow up. So um, for those just joining us, I'll just say again, we've got Andy O'Brien from Bristol Community Energy, and we've also got um, Kate Royston from Tamar Community Energy. So welcome both. Um, and so you've both been um, operating in this space for quite some years now. And I thought it'd be great to just get you both to give us um, some background to what you do and uh, the projects that you've been working on. And just to give people an idea of uh, where you are and um, who else is on the team. So just a general flavor. So um, Kate, would you like to go first and then Andy to follow? So just about five minutes of an intro for us. Uh, thanks, thanks very much, Lisa. So I'm uh, Kate Royston from Tamar Energy Community and uh, as an organization, we, we, we straddle the Tamar, Tamar River, which um, divides West Devon um, and Cornwall, or you could say unites at West Devon and Cornwall. We formed Tamar Energy Community in 2014 and we've been working uh, on the energy advice and support um, through Transition Tavistock a few years prior to that as well. And um, our key, key mission is to, um, to localise energy. We feel strongly um, about the need to um, support the tran uh, energy transition. Um, some people talk about the four Ds, so um, democratisation, uh, decarbonisation, decentralisation and digitisation and we feel that uh, locally we're well placed to help uh, move those things forward. Um, our work is uh, focused around uh, energy advice and support to um, people from uh, the more vulnerable communities that we work with but also a growing able to pay market. We support uh, activities around innovation, so we've been involved in um, a project called Open LV, which has been very interesting, and we can talk more about that if people are interested. Engagement and communication is really important, um, together with renewable generation, and that's what um, we're talking about today. Um, we're very proud of our six um, solar installations uh, which um, total 327 kilowatts and um, they they bring a lot of benefit to the host sites uh, but they also bring benefit to our local community and we're, we're hoping to add um, something a, an additional roof to the portfolio fairly soon uh, we were delighted that um, our share offer was uh, taken up so quickly. Um, there was a lot of work that went into preparing for it, uh, but we, we did enjoy doing that. And um, we always 
uh, enjoy working together well as a team locally. Um, the, our share offer at the moment is uh, on, um, on pause because um, uh, it, it was uh, very well received. Uh, so due to the overwhelming interest, we're currently investigating whether we can raise more via the current share offer, which includes speaking with our loan provider to see if we can repay the amount in full. Um, we felt, felt it was important to note that the share offer has enabled us to reduce the amount of debt that we have within Tamar Energy Community. And uh, by uh, exchanging debt for community shares, it means that uh, we have a reduction in um, our costs, which uh, will en enable us to increase our community benefit and the work that we do within the community. Um, but importantly, it also helps uh, widen our membership, um, our membership base and work with um, more um, local investors who are keen to support the work that we're doing. And I hope that that provides a quick snapshot about some of the stuff that we're doing. Yes, that's great, Kate. And, and the, all the important question, which someone's already asked, is when will you be able to let people know whether you can um, start raising again or not? How long do you anticipate the discussions to go on for with your um, loan provider, etc.? Well, the, um, the offer is, uh, was scheduled to close on October the 30th. Um, so I, I think our aim is to, is to have a, a clear understanding of our position prior to that. Okay, thank you. And Andy, over to you. Um, I should start by saying, sorry, Bristol Energy Cooperative, sorry, not Bristol Community Energy as I introduced you. Um, Andy has been working in the space for many, many years and has got amazing experience bringing to bear, you know, lots of projects in and around the Bristol area. So Andy, tell us some more about what you're working on and, and your, your history. Hello, yeah, yeah, thanks. Thanks very much, Lisa. Hello, everybody. Yeah, I'm, my name's Andy O'Brien. I'm a co-founder and director of Bristol Energy Cooperative. So yeah, we started in 2011, uh, in meeting in cafes and pubs as you do. Uh, we were all volunteers then. Uh, now uh, we have uh, four members of staff. Uh, I'm 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 one of those. I'm a paid member of staff, uh, and we we now own uh, twelve. We have basically 12, 12 million pounds worth of of energy assets. So over the years, we've, we've developed sixteen renewable energy projects. So uh, 15 of those are actually solar. We've got two large solar farms, uh, 13 rooftop solar projects, and one battery storage project. Uh, and together, though, those generate enough electricity to power uh, 3,000 uh, typical, typical homes. And uh, alongside that also, as, as we are actually, a, a technically, we are a community benefit society, our, our mission is, is to provide a benefit to, to the community. We've, we've actually facilitated uh, over £250,000 worth of community benefit payments to the, to the community in, in various ways over the years. Um, so we've, we've raised that, 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 those £12 million pounds from uh, a combination of both uh, commercial investments and community investments. Uh, about five, five million of that has come from community investments and that's been from, from share offers and, and bond offers. Uh, quite a lot of that's come through the F FX platform over the years, in fact probably most of it. And so we, we've got a, a, current, a current share offer on the FX platform and that's, that's for, uh, for two million. And so that's for uh, a little bit more solar, uh, a hydro scheme, which has uh, been about four years in development. <laughs> Out of all the schemes to try and develop, hydro is a real challenge, but uh, it's got planning permission. Uh, and so we're, we're getting close to the finishing line, really, in a way. Raising the money is, is probably the, the, last, the last big stage in it. So uh, we've got a hydro scheme and we've got a very exciting, innovative scheme, a microgrid, which is combining lots of really cutting edge technologies. Uh, and that's on a new build housing scheme in Bristol, which is, is being built out as we speak. Uh, so yes, that's, I think that's us in a nutshell. Great, thanks Andy. And just 
to dig into that a bit more. What was your original, when you were back there in the pub all those years ago, what was the, um, what was the driving force to, to get you to where you are today? Uh, well, I've, I've had quite a portfolio career really. I mean, my original background was in teaching. I was a teacher for 10 years. Uh, and then I moved into IT, IT and uh, project management. Uh, but alongside that, uh, I'd always had an interest in, uh, uh, I suppose, development issues. I, I've, I've been a very, very long-term member of, uh, well, it's, it's now Global Justice now, but it was then known as the World, Deve World Development Movement. And, and so I, I, I've been very involved in, in, in those issues that that organisation uh, works on. So the Jubilee 2000 campaign, Make Poverty History, Trade Justice issues. Uh, and so it was actually uh, Global Justice now that, that, that started talking about climate change all those years ago. And at, at, the, at the time I knew nothing about it. But I thought, okay, well, if they're talking about it, it, it must be important. So that convinced me to get, to get involved. And that's uh, led me to set up a, a sustainability group in the part of Bristol where I was living at the time. Uh, and then through that, I thought, well, this is good, but I felt, okay, you know, we, we st I still felt we need to do slightly more in terms of actually physically growing stuff or actually building stuff. So that's, that's where the idea of, okay, let's see if we can actually fund some stuff, actually put some solar panels on roofs, but we'll need the money to do it. And at that time, the, the transition movement was really beginning to, to build and there's a fantastic conference that uh, the transition Bristol people put on in um, in Bristol just as I was thinking about this uh, where Rob Hopkins came and spoke and lots of other people and there's a, a fantastic buzz in that in that room and all sorts of things came out of that that day I think really and there are other people in that room and who are thinking maybe of doing the same thing dotted around Bristol and sort of we came together and that, that formed, a, I suppose, the seed to actually set up the energy core. So it, it took us probably a year to do it because you know, it just does to, to, to work through the detail. And uh, yeah, we went on actually did all the, the sort of the admin of, of setting it up and then started to work through the detail and took, took the leap because we, we really didn't know if it would go anywhere. You know, our first target was to raise 88,000 pounds to install solar panels on two roofs and we set off with our first share offer not knowing whether it would work at all but in the end you know, we, we, you know, we, we over raised and managed to do three roofs and uh, went from there really. Mm, great and, and Kate obviously you've, you were connected to the transition movement as well. Uh, yes so our, our roots were in transition to Avastock and uh, uh, so that, that started off back in the 2008-2009 now uh, and uh, there was um, you know there's always been quite a movement around um, the, the southwest uh, around transition um, and also around energy work and uh, and that's really continued I mean we have um, similarly to Bristol with a strong network of community energy groups we have a very strong network of community energy groups around Devon, we all work together to help support each other and help um, increase our capacity and capability. And I think it's important to note that um, whilst, you know, many of us spend quite a lot of time contributing to our organisations on a volunteer basis, um, you know, um, the majority of us are all professional people um, who, are, who are giving our time to help progress this important um, movement towards more local energy. Yeah, I noticed that you're, uh, you've got uh, quite a few uh, acronyms after your name, Kate. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I mean, I have quite, quite a lot of experience in working in, in various different industries and things over the years. Um, and I think that just adds to your um, ability to, um, understand and move things forward you know my uh, my mantra is that the most important thing is to have good common sense and some patience and the ability to listen yes well i think something that's common across all, all uh people who've worked within community energy is 
it's it's a bunch of doers. Um, you you have to get your hands dirty. And you've got to get stuff done. Um, and Andy, I've had experience with um, hydro myself, having tried to um, build a hydro project, a uh, community project on the River Thames here, which unfortunately, for various reasons, we have not managed to do, although we did get planning permission, but it ran into difficulties. So I admire your uh, resilience to push ahead to get that done. Um, it sounds like it's going to be an exciting new project. When would that build be? We're actually aiming to build out in the spring. Okay. Yeah. I mean, there are a couple of uh, questions about it in the chat. Do you want me to go through those now? Well, I will just um, bring them into the discussion now. So let's let's get into the some some of the nitty gritty. And um, I'm Lisa Ashford, by the way, Peter, who's listening in. Uh, I'm the CEO of FX. So, um, Andy, obviously your organisation has been running for a number of years and as you said, you've, you've launched uh, a number of projects um, which become part of this bigger portfolio. Do, so how do all the projects roll together? Are they held within the same organisational structure or are they separate? And as shareholders, how do people get um, paid an interest? rates and and what has that looked like for the last few years so yes uh, there is when when people are, in, are investing into into the energy cooperative there is there is one cooperative um, when we do major projects then we we set up special purpose vehicles for those uh, uh, particular schemes so for example we've got Two, two, very, two large solar farms, which provide at the moment the vast majority of the income for the schemes. So they have special purpose vehicles associated with them. Um, and they actually have uh, commercial bank loans um, against those uh, schemes as well. And so the, the actual commercial loans are against the, the, the special, or it's directly into special purpose vehicle. Uh, but the, from the, the community investment is going into the top level, uh, into 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 the, the cooperative, um, and then the we we use those funds to go into the relevant schemes as we develop them. So you know, that, that that could be the rooftop scheme, it could be a solar farm, it could be the microgrids, um, uh, and it could be the hydro. Now, up, up till now, when we you know, the community energy sector has had the, not just community energy sector, the whole, the whole energy sector has had the benefit of the, the feed-in tariffs, which has given a, you know, the comfort of a, a guaranteed income stream. So that's, that's enabled us to, to project a, a, certain, a, a certain rate of return. Um, now the feed-in tariff isn't with us, we, we, we can't project the same rate of return that we could have done for those earlier schemes. So we're, I suppose we're in, a, we're in a different world. So we are projecting a lower rate of return for, for, for the schemes in this, in this share offer. Um, so you know, that's, that's, what, that's what we, yes, yeah, so you, if you look back at our, earlier, at our previous share offers, we were projecting a rate of return of 5%, and that's what we've met in, in, in in, in, in previous years, in this share offer, we uh, we are projecting a rate of return of three point five percent. Right. Are they different um, shares? I suppose also to say we don't know what will happen in the future. It, it could be in in future share offers, in future years, we may get a government that actually brings back a a level of support for, say, community energy that that, that would allow us to to provide a. A different rate of return and it's this is it's a very difficult environment to work in really you're, you're trying to do something in the present while also slightly trying to work out what may happen in the future so that's something we're always trying to to bear in mind but certainly for for this for this current share offer what we're projecting is is 3.5 percent based on what we know in terms of the our financial modelling for, for what we what we know these, these these projects could do, based on 
current best evidence available to us in terms of the, the energy market and our, our current best knowledge of it, all the different factors that go into our, our financial modelling. Thanks, Andy. Um, and just to be absolutely clear then, will the previous shareholders continue get to get 5%, but new shareholders who are investing in these projects will get 3.5%? Is that what you're saying? Yes, yeah, so, so at, at, at the AGM, we will, we, it, it'll, it'll be down to the, ultimately, it'll be down to the members to decide. And, uh, but yes, we, 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 will, we will be saying for the, for the uh, uh, investments, the, the projects in the previous investments before, previous to, to this particular share offer, we will be recommending an interest rate for that, for the particular year in question at a certain rate and then for the, for, the, for this particular share offer we'll be recommending an interest rate at a particular rate and there, you know we expect there to be a difference between those two interest rates and I think it'll be up to the members to to either accept that or or not accept it but yes we do expect there to be a difference between the two yes um and someone asked a question about you know obviously this is when we start talking about SPVs, um, special purpose vehicles, we are getting right into the realms of um, sophisticated uh, investment structures, which for some might seem sort of quite far from the original community energy, you know, smaller projects. Um, and clearly, both of you have had quite a lot of um, advice and support along the way to help to structure your offers um, in the right way. And, and also, as I mentioned before, um, just because people are volunteering on community energy schemes doesn't necessarily mean that they don't have the skills to do the work that's required. And, and there's a lot of highly skilled um, people who volunteer on community energy projects. But Kate, do you want to um, just pick up on that as well in terms of some of the support you've had and the skills in the team? Uh, yes, thanks, thanks Lisa. Um, it's an important point. I mean, I guess whoever we are, we start, um, we, we start with, with limited knowledge or, or knowledge that we, that we may have gained from our various academic studies and, and general experience. Um, and uh, what we've uh, tried to make sure we do as a community energy community, because we have a very um, strong community across uh, England in particular through Community Energy England as an example, is to work together to build our capacity and capabilities um, in, in, in Devon and in Tamar Energy Community. We've had um, support from uh, each other and from um, Devon County Council, for example, who um, put in place working with Regen um, a number of small funds which provided um, some, um, some, some amounts of money that, that helped us build our expertise. And uh, there is a very important fund, at least um, accessible by rural, more rural communities uh, such as ourselves, called the Rural Community Energy Fund, which um, provides some funding for, for feasibility studies and that enables us to bring in um, technical and professional support to help us build our cases, understand the right business models and community models. And of course, through that process, it means that each of us who are working within the organisations build our own knowledge and expertise that we can then move on to, to follow on projects. And certainly within our board, we have legal representation, technical representation, people who are good on the community side and uh, a number of all-rounders. So um, I think we're, you know, we, we are always um, uh, very keen on uh, new people who want to come and join us and get more involved. But um, we also have, uh, you know, uh, an important growing base of expertise within our organisations and within our fellow organisations. Um, uh, mm. uh, it, it's an important community. Yeah, and, and it's fair to say as well, I think that in this uh, sector, there's also quite a lot of 
good peer-to-peer -peer learning and support so you know the more established community energy groups um, give support to some of the newer ones which is which is really good um, it's a sort of shared IP sort of situation I think within this sector which is is quite refreshing um, and Andy you mentioned that there were four people on on the team now who are employed um, by Beck um, who, who makes up the team? Uh, so there's myself and uh, my uh, fellow director Chris Speller uh, then we've got our uh, administrator uh, Vicky Wakefield Jarrett and then uh, there's uh, Will Horton who's a, a project developer who's uh, joined us uh, just in the last couple of months uh, who's uh, working on particularly on the hydro scheme uh, he came he came from a, a hydro uh, a consultancy who, who specialize in hydro so uh, uh, he, he's, he's very very good uh, also just just to go back to the question around sort of uh, expertise and uh, we you know we, we work with an awful lot of sort of outside experts so actually I would say for example our management accountancy you know we although he's, he's not um, he's not a paid member of staff we we we, we um, he's, he's, he's sort of a third party who, who, who works for us on a, on a, on a monthly basis. So that, that's where our management account support comes from. He, he prefers to be self-employed rather than uh, be, be, be part of the paid staff. Um, and also, for example, in, in terms of, because the, like I said, this is almost like the brave new world of, uh, we, you know, no, no feeding tariff support, therefore, we, we, at the moment, we do have to pay a, a low rate of return on investment. We did consider, well, should we actually set up a completely new cooperative? Because it, it is going to be quite complex to al almost like administer things going forward. So, you know, we, we, we did take advice that, that there, are, there, there are a number of uh, organisations who specialise in cooperative development who, uh, who we went to. To, to talk through this in great detail. In fact, the people we went to were the people who advised us at the very outset when we set up. So they they know us very well. Uh, they're very local. They know. So you know, we, we talked through in detail about what we should do. You know, and their their advice I think was really well. You could set up a new thing, but for now, let's take it as it is, and then let's see. You know, it. it and I think I think it is slightly wait and see. Let's just see what happens over the next year or two, and then if if it really feels like it's just becoming too complex, and partly it's up to the members. If the members say, "Look, Andy, this is far too complex now. It's just too messy. We feel that it needs a bit of a clean break," then we'll then we'll set up something new. But you know, there's a downside to it because it's more administration. It's a lot of it's a lot of work. This all it does take a lot of work. So, but if the members want us to do that. We will do, but at the moment, we feel that, that, that this is probably the right way to go. But our AGM is is, is coming up, so uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get we'll get some feedback there. Good, thank um, you. Um, so there's a couple of specific questions. If I can um, fire them off to you both. So Andy, can you tell us a bit more about the hydro and uh, what type of scheme is it? How big is it? Uh, and the battery storage as well. Yeah, so the hydro is, I wish I had a will on the call here. Um, it's, I think it's a 300 kilowatts Archimedes screw, so it's, it's going to be two turbines and it will generate enough power to uh, power, I think it's uh, 250 homes on average. So it's it's we've done a lot of sort of site surveying around the Bristol area and it's the only site that's actually feasible and um, we've got all, all, all the consents in place so it's, it's got planning from the uh, Bristol City Council it's got the consents from the Environment Agency um, and it's actually very good in terms of uh, we were putting in uh, fish passes as well and so it, it's 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 a good gain and sort of environmentally 
So we, in terms of the, the ERDF grant, the way this is working, and because there's a question about whether it'll be effective by Brexit or not, the, these grants are uh, delivered in, in five year blocks. And this block ran from 2015 to 2020. So they're coming to the end of the block and they want to sort of get it done and dusted. So it's been running, like I say, for five years and it's not, it's not, it's, it, it isn't affected at all by what happens at, at the end of 2020 in terms of Boris's discussions with, with the EU. They just want to get it completed and out of the way. So um, we just want to, to get it out of the way as well. But you know, there, there, are, there are conditions around the match funding. So it's, it's crucial to us that we, that we do raise these funds. Uh, now, we, we are in discussions with, with various parties about, about how we could find, uh, if we don't raise the, these, the total amount, there are, we are in discussions with various parties about how we can potentially find that, sh that shortfall. But that, but that is a, uh, that's not our preferred option. So you know, we, we, we do very much want to raise it through, uh, through the share offer if we can do. Yeah, absolutely. As do we, of course. <laughs> um, and uh, ju just where is it, Andy, the hydro? So it's on Netham Weir, which is actually, it's about a mile from Temple Mead Station, around the back. Uh, so if, if you were getting the, if you were getting the, yeah, the train out of Temple Mead out, uh, say, I don't know, on the way to London, you, you'd, you'd pretty much pass it within the first two minutes. Right. Uh, going through, it's, 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 it's on the, well, it is in an industrial, in an, an industrial estate so it, it doesn't look particularly pretty when you're when you're stood there but it's um yeah it's, it's amazingly close to to an urban center which is not it's not typical yes great and um there was one other question um about the um battery storage yeah so we we are really excited about this one um so this is a this is genuinely a UK first. So what we're doing here is creating the UK's first community owned net zero domestic housing microgrid. So this is based on what we've been doing over the last few years. So a couple of years ago, we, 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 um, we funded uh, a 100, kilo, I think it was a 100 kilowatt battery at a new build housing site. Uh, in Winchester of all places and we've been running that for a couple of years and got a lot of experience of that and that's given us the confidence to to take things forward and that actually has been that's actually been used to to provide electricity uh, to the national grid it, it's part of a, a much bigger aggregated scheme so you know when the, when the national grid is uh, Sometimes it needs to actually, it's used to balance the grid. So sometimes the, the, the grid has too much electricity, sometimes the grid has not enough electricity. And big, big aggregators are, are called to, to help that balancing process. And, and that's what we're, we're doing with that battery. And we're using that technology in this microgrid here. Uh, so so this, this housing site in Bristol, uh, it's combining it's 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 a housing complex. I think it's, it's twenty one houses and flats, and it's been built out right now. So it's like a, a typical ho housing site, but but it's a very forward looking developer, and so you and that they're, they're, they're self builders. So because they're forward looking, that they're, they're willing to work with us on this, and so we're funding some of the microgrids, and so you've got elements that everybody or you guys on the call will know about because you, you know, you're, you're into this. So you've got very good energy efficiency standards on the housing. Uh, you've got on-site renewables, so you've got solar panels on the roof, you're using heat pumps uh, for heating and hot water, and you've got battery storage. And these are all linked together through, uh, through smart technology. And the key thing is that uh, this is all shared across the site. So it's not just like each individual house is just it's got its own solar and its own individual battery. It's got one big battery on the site 
and that enables the solar and the uh, to be shared across the site. So you, you, you get much better use of the solar that way. And because it's a bat big battery, again, it, it works better so, so that it actually in increases the, the use on site. And it means that you don't have to go almost like off site as much to, to top, your, top up your energy. And that's, that actually means that from a financial point of view, it, it works better and, and it, it actually makes the financial model better and makes it more, yeah, more viable. It, it, and so that's, that's why we, so that's, that's why we've got involved. And we've, we've, been, we've been wanting to do this for quite some time and we've actually set up a, a joint venture with another community energy company, uh, Chelwood Community Energy, uh, and a company called CPRO, Clean Energy Prospector, who we work, we've been working with uh, for a number of years. They're a, a Bristol-based startup. Uh, and we, we're, we're, we're looking to develop a, a number of microgrid sites like this with forward-thinking uh, housing groups who want to do this because we, the big, the big housing developers should be doing this. They should be doing net zero housing across the country, but they're not typically, you know, they're still building housing developments where they just stick in a gas boiler. And they're, they're doing this because basically they can't be bothered to make the effort to do things the right way. And so we, we said, well, if they're not gonna do it, we will. And what we, what, what we want to do is make it exemplar. And, and so, uh, this is the first site in Bristol. There's another site in Bridport in Devon, which is bigger. And that's, a sec that's the second one in our pipeline. And then there's a third one in Froome, hopefully, that if that goes ahead, that's, I think, 300, 300 homes. Um, and the idea is that this, 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 uh, this, this joint venture is called the microgrid boundary. So the idea is that we, we take on some of the risk, the financial risk, because there's there's an additional cost in, in setting, in doing it this way, uh, because it's all quite new, quite different. A typical housing developer wouldn't necessarily want to do it. And some, some of the cost is almost like the, the intellectual cost of actually spending more time thinking about how to do things differently. So we're willing to invest the time and effort in talking to architects and talking to construction people about doing it a bit differently. Uh, and then if we do it at the right time in the development process, in the thinking process, then uh, hopefully two years down the line when the thing's actually built out, it will have all the right things built, built in. And so what, what the microgrid foundry is doing that. Um, and so, uh, yes, the, the, this is the first, the, the first real life project where right now those houses are being built right now. Um, the battery, the Tesla battery is on order. We have to put, put in the deposit in the next few weeks. It'll be physically installed in the next few months. And hopefully in the next year, those residents will be li living in a microgrid environment. And it won't look that different to, to them, but they will, be, they, will, they will be doing it. They'll be in, hopefully in a net zero environment. And, and then we can turn around to you know, the likes of I won't name names, but you know those big house developers, and say they they're doing it, we're doing it. Why aren't you? Yeah, brilliant. I mean, I think that's the way that we, you know, we want to see new developments um, being put together, right? And and hopefully there will be sufficient policy changes over time, which will mean that you know we will uh, see that absolutely needing to be done um, but as you say if you can create the exemplar projects then others will hopefully follow um, it sounds excellent um, Kate you wanted to talk about um, the local authority support um, can you just tell us a bit more about that yeah so um, first of all um, I'd like to echo uh, Andy's uh, and their groups of frustration on the, the way in which uh, energy is uh, introduced into uh, housing developments these days. And we, we're also doing work to, to look at opportunities around this. And our sister organisation um, 
in South Hams, South Dartmoor Community Energy has also got a, a microgrid based uh, housing development um, on the cards. Um, but yes, um, it, it, somebody asked a question about county councils, uh, uh, involvement with the county council and um, the local authority um, involvement and partnership across Devon has been very important um, to us and I think you know similarly in in other places so we were actually invited uh, so the community energy groups and transition groups across uh, a part of Devon were invited to get together in 2012 and form a partnership um, and help support the local authorities in in addressing the need for um, to look at uh, community approaches to energy where local authorities really didn't have the uh, the knowledge and the expertise or, or, or the budgets to do that and and that move resulted in, in us all working together and we're now a very strong family across Devon under the banner of uh, Devon Community Energy Network and uh, we're also developing a, an overarching um, organisation uh, called Devon Energy Collective to do to big, bigger projects together and we also work together to address uh, fuel your poverty initiatives through Cozy De uh, sorry Cozy Devon, which is um, a partnership between um, the community energy groups and all the local authorities across Devon, and uh, really the support that we've had and the way in which we we work together has enabled us to grow and develop um, a, a lot of community benefit societies across Devon and. Um, and those lessons, are, you know, have been learned in, in other places. So um, I think it's really important that um, there, there is that link um, between the local authorities and, and, and community energy groups. And we um, have just uh, um, been successful uh, with um, at the Green Homes Grant Local Authority um, delivery. It's a... Uh, it's uh, some money from government uh, with a Devon wide bid. Um, so it enables us all to work together and learn from each other, um, both in the renewable space, um, in you know housing developments and in delivering energy advice and support. Thanks, Kate. Um, so there was a, I'm gonna pick up a couple of questions and let's see if we can just, um, let's just see if we can run through them. Um, okay, so one of the questions was around, uh, and the questions do just come to the panel, um, I think, uh, in this session. Um, there was a question about why isn't everybody getting involved in community energy investing, considering, you know, interest rates are going to uh, zero or negative. Um, and, you know, I think it's a fair question. Um, from our point of view, it's very much a, I mean, obviously an investment is not the same as a savings in terms of risk. Uh, and, you know, when you're investing, you are putting your capital at risk, which is the most important thing to uh, remember, of course. But really, we find it's an education uh, issue. It's a sort of lack of accessibility issue. Um, we hope to be able to, over time, reduce the minimum investment size so that more and more um, people can get involved and younger people with less disposable income can get involved. Um, but largely, I think it's, it's lack of awareness and, and a whole fear about investing and it not being you know, something that I know how to do, whereas actually, um, you know, with a little bit of education and care, people could get involved at a very small level and dip their toe in the water. Um, and actually the, uh, it's coming up to Good Money Week and I think the focus um, really from them is, is around taking action actually. And if you go to the um, Good Money website, um, Good Money Week website, which we can give, we can send out afterwards. It's all about how you can take action with your money in small ways. Um, so coming back to a couple of these other questions. So um, Andy, could you just absolutely nail this one? Uh, why do you think that uh, ERDF final decision is not affected by Brexit? I thought you said that because 
that segment is is already sort of counted for and you're just coming to the end but yeah yeah that's right i mean it, it's a block of money which is allocated in a in a in a five-year block so and that block is coming to it to an end in in 2020 it's 50, 2015 to 2020 so it's the decision to allocate the money was made in 2015 um, and it's, it's not it's not dependent on brexit yes so presumably that money needs to be allocated before the end of the year hopefully or at least you need to have hit your minimum to to be able to match it is that fair yeah i mean i mean ultimately the the, the people administrate administering the the grant applications quite a lot of them have been pulled away onto covid so they're actually quite stretched so in a way they're is that they're probably as as under time pressure as we are so brexit is is is, is almost like the least brexit is really not an issue and i, I, I i'm not i can kind of put it um yeah brexit, brexit really isn't an issue and they're not they're not just going to suddenly say oh we can't do all this because because of covid we just have to keep keep doing what we're doing and the important thing is we, we, we just keep we just keep on raising the money and and, and, and we're in very good discussions with them and, and we're and we, we, we're both aware that we, we just keep doing what we're doing under the pressures of covid and we keep sticking to the processes yeah okay thank you um there's a question around bonds versus shares and i know um you have had bonds before um andy that we've raised and i know people like bonds because they are um more liquid and they tend to be shorter dated uh, in terms of the term and i guess this comes back to perhaps one of the questions why isn't everybody getting involved in community energy? I mean, community energy is a very long-term uh, patient form of, or, or community share, sorry, uh, long-term form of capital, um, but with potential withdrawals built in. But how do you go about deciding, Andy, the combination of shares versus bonds? What's, what's the decision-making process? And, and Kate, perhaps you could, um, just tell us whether it's something that you considered as well yeah so when we did when we when we issued bonds at that time we were trying to raise basically five five million pounds in a in a quite short period so we we actually did a combination of bonds and and shares uh and that was that i suppose that was the guidance we were we were given because the i think the the bond the bond offer yeah did did was was attractive to people because they could see it was a a, sh a short term investment to a three a two a year period or a three year period they could see what the, the the rate was they could understand that they could they would have their money back after those that period had elapsed and so it was a, it it was a it, it was a fairly simple package which which they could go with and we needed to get the money quickly so they could go with that. Um, but at the same time, we did we did run a share offer as well, a, a more traditional share offer like we're doing now. But you know, there's no doubt about it. It it is it is quite complex to explain that to a to to people who are new to community energy. You know, what is a withdrawable share? You know, how how do you get your money back? Um, and so, yes. It, it, it's difficult to if you, to just run those in a in a more time pressured environment. So that's why we were doing bonds. Um, I mean, some of those bonds we, we still have. In fact, the the majority of the bonds we ran, we we did it, we did put in place the ability for people to keep those bonds if they wanted to, if it was actually also useful for us. So those bonds have run past their initial term, and most of the people have actually chosen to keep those bonds in place. Um, but what we're trying to do generally is those bonds are we're at a higher rate than say our current share offer is and 
although there are we did put in place that the bonds would run at a lower rate once they'd gone past their initial term and they are uh, you know we, we're generally generally going through a sort of a refinancing process on on lots of our initial uh, commercial loans and our initial financing and it's in some ways community shares is the best way of being able to do that because you're in charge of that process each year you come to the AGM and you you suggest to your members what rate that should be um, whereas with bonds you, you know you're tied into the rate so that's that's ultimately community shares are, are, are a good way to go we think yeah Kate was it ever something that you considered uh, not for, for this particular um, refinancing um, refinancing project because we we were looking to um, uh, to put in place something that um, could take us through the lifetime of the project I know, um, somebody's made a comment about investing for 25 years but that's not necessarily the case in the way in which these um, withdrawable shares work and, and, and which our business models work is that uh, you know we the intention is to is to start repaying a proportion of the of the share capital back um, after so many years so that as we go through the length of the life of the project the amount that's held in community shares reduces uh, over a period of time which enables those investors who are interested in having their money back sooner um, to get the money back, but it also means that it reduces the amount of um, return that's, that's paid out by the Community Energy Group, um, which enables us to increase the community benefit. Um, I, I think, you know, it's just that the key thing to say is that it's not, um, it, it's not necessarily possible to, to say exactly how much will be will be returned um, over the period of the time but um, you know we've modeled this carefully and, and and that's what's laid out within our our share offer document for example yeah thank you and Andy how do you manage the withdrawal of shares so far we haven't we haven't refused any requests for, uh, for shares to be returned okay I, I mean I think it's something that we need to sort of work on perhaps in terms of communicating better the way that withdrawable shares are uh, managed by organizations um, and i think that's that's something if we want to scale up that is quite important actually um, just another point on the um uh tax relief uh, that someone mentions that yes we as an industry um we lobbied quite hard actually to have social investment tax relief um, brought back in for community energy after the fits were removed. Um, but I think as far as Treasury are concerned, they're even considering whether SITR has a life at all, let alone uh, to include anything else within the scope. So, uh, but rest assured, um, there's quite a lot of lobbying going on. Um, something that we've been part of um, and there's various working groups as well so um, it is something that we understand obviously would benefit the sector greatly um, so we will not rest on our laurels. Um, I think we're probably uh, due to sort of round up is there anything um, Kate or Andy that you'd just like to finish off with? Kate if you'd like to go first. Uh, well, I, I guess, um, you know, uh, we, I, we would like to thank everybody for their um, interest in um, being involved in this today and um, being interested in supporting community energy. And if there are people that would like to get more actively involved, then, um, you know, do, do get in touch. Andy. Uh, yeah, if I could, I'd just like to address... Uh, one of the questions around sort of profits and losses um, we at the moment we typically do make a loss and one of the reasons for this is is depreciation so uh, i've mentioned that our solar farms uh, provide 
the vast majority of our income. And so uh, tip, you know, the typical uh, accounting procedures are that, that you know, they, they have like, uh, I think it's a 20 year, 20 year or maybe 25 year straight line depreciation. And so on that, so uh, the depreciation can be, in fact, we've just literally uh, signed off our, this year's accounts and the depreciation on, on those uh, is over like 350,000 pounds. So this, the, this year's accounts, we've actually come out, I mean, there, there are a couple of other one-off issues, which are, which are, are, the accounts will be on our website within the next couple of days. So you, if you want to download those and, and look through, the very, there's a very detailed report, which goes through why there are a couple of one-off um, uh, items in there. But this year's loss is 385,000. But of that, I think it's 350,000 is depreciation. So that, please, please do bear in mind that that's always in there, but, but it's, you know, that it's, it always looks worse than it is. And also, is it, we, we've got large loans on, on the banks, on the, on the solar farms. And it's a bit like a, on a, a repayment mortgage, you know, at the outset, you're, you're paying off very little of your capital because you're paying largely interest and it's only towards the, the end when you've paid off uh, a lot of that interest that you start paying off bigger bigger chunks and it's the same with, with us really. Well, it's only really when you model, it's only towards the end of the the, the, the bank loan that, that you start freeing up quite a lot more money and typically the models for, for these schemes, it's really only at the end that you get the community benefit accruing and what we did, we deliberately said, well, no, we're not going to have this. We're not going to wait 20 years before we start paying out community benefit. So we front loaded our community benefits in the first year, in the big, in the big year when we, when we raised the 10 million and we got the two big solar farms over the line just in time for feeding tariffs. We put 50,000 pounds into a community benefit fund deliberately because we said we're going to front load our community benefit. So we, we've done some of these things, you know, hopefully for the right reasons, but it does have a bit, a bit of an effect on the, on, the, on the profit and loss. Good, thank you, Andy. I was, I was going to actually say that anyone with specific questions, of course, can either contact you know, yourselves or us and we'll direct the questions. Um, but thank you for that clarification because I think it's really important. And, and I suppose just to, to end, um, you know, for those of you, uh, who are listening in, you know, how can we get more in people involved in, in, you know, community energy obviously is for all of us to be talking about it a lot more with all of our friends and to be sharing where we're getting involved, whether that's, you know, dipping a toe in the water and making a very small investment or volunteering or just, you know, anything basically finding out about anything that's going on in your local community and get involved. So um, just remains to say thank you very much to Kate and Andy for joining me today. Really appreciate you taking the time and I hope everybody's found it interesting at home. Um, and look forward to um, the next Kappa Club. See you again soon. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye. See you.